Our guest is German, <laughs> and um, we'll also be looking at a few German thinkers, and maybe you've read the text in original German. I did some of that for my dissertation, but I'm not fluent. So for those of you who have those tools in German, like it'll definitely be helpful in the next few days. So I appreciate your input. Um, that's basically it. So I'd like to do introductions. I know it's kind of like you all know each other, so we don't have to spend too long on it, but if you can just basically just tell me who you are, where you're from, and I was thinking today, to, should it be why you're here or what you're doing? So if you could kind of put that into one, like, you know, what is, like, what is your, your interest? I mean, I know Wolfgang kind of really comes up against, at least he did when I was here, to sort of say, you know, why are you here and what are you doing? And answer it in a sentence, you know, like, what is your interest, your purpose, or your, you feel that what you're trying to accomplish here? So if you can tell me that, and we'll start with Paulette. So, so, so has anyone seen this before? Okay, so you want to tell us what this is? Yeah. <laughs> That's a much bigger question than having seen. Um, it's an incredible piece of contemporary art that I saw in the Hirschhorn Museum in Washington, D.C. Um, and, and I don't know. I'm interested in doing. I, and I haven't thought about it in a couple of years. So okay. if anyone else has seen it, I would like to start the conversation. About how it, the feelings you were thinking you were saying when you saw it, or? No, about the work of art in relation to um, art historical narratives, narratives of consumption, narratives of uh, fashion and textile in relation to the history of art. Um, the, I mean, the thicketed with any work of art, polyvalent uh, ways of approaching it. So. Has anyone else seen it in person? No? No? Well, I've seen it. Yeah. <laughs> so we can talk a, a bit about it. I mean, I'm, I was at a collector. There are several versions of this. And I was at the home of a collector who had a version of this piece. And when I entered the home, I was sort of like, I thought, immediately I thought laundry. I just thought, because I was, I was the only person visiting the house, and I thought, why do they have this enormous pile of laundry, you know, at the entrance of their home? And I was like, that's a little unusual. And it kind of confronts you. I mean, they, sort of the feelings you're reflecting on, or like you're getting confronted when you see this piece with this sense of excess, waste, but... Um, or what is rubbish? Like, what constitutes the disposability? So, mm -hmm. uh, there's narratives of, like, trash and... Uh, Appropriation, um, the question of foundness, what constitutes a found object mm -hmm. versus a fashioned object, mm -hmm. um, and is there a distinction there mm -hmm. between those? Yes. Between those ways of approaching a work of art or uh, any kind of materiality. Okay. And also a sense of juxtaposition, right? The sense that sort of choice of putting these things together, and that is sort of that assemblage that we have with fashion as well, like the decision that you make, I mean, even when you buy mass-produced clothing, to combine it with something, to make it personal, and so this, that sense of combination and juxtaposition is also relevant. Um, and then the artist, Pistoletto, does anyone know him or any of his other work? Pistoletto, okay, so he's an Italian artist that does sort of a wide variety. I mean, this is very uncharacteristic, I would say. Um, he has other works, like at Venice, The Last Venice, I don't know if anybody went to that, but the Broken Mirrors project was his. Um, does anyone remember the, the room of broken mirrors? Okay, that, last yeah. year. Yeah, you guys went. Okay, so the broken mirrors project was his, and then um, he has done, you know, large scale installations. He's done some even painting and some kind of very different sculptures. So this is unusual for him to put two sort of ready-made types of things. Um, not that the other is a ready-made obviously. Sculpture, but I mean, the two idea of ideas of created things together. So I just thought I would start with this because. This idea of fashion is also related to what is clothes, right, as well. So can you go to the next slide? But, um, and here's something to reflect on. And Show Studio is um, something we'll be using throughout the next three days. It's basically a website for fashion media, mainly fashion films. So if you don't know it, um, we'll be using material from that. Um, and it's a very relevant site um, for all types of things. I mean, I think like um, Brad Pitt like read a love poem, and then you have something like Walter Pfeiffer did um, a project that's more outsider, and then so it kind of brings together contemporary and commercial culture with sort of more esoteric things. And it was founded by a photographer named Nick Knight. 
So I'll just stop talking and let you guys read this. I just wanted to start with this because I find that fashion is probably the most easily dismissed. Um, it's sort of often considered, you know, oh, it's for women, or it's sort of this superficial thinking, or it's just whatever it might be. But um, there's something else there as well um, in terms of how we express our identity, um, value choices, how we, you know, every day, the clothes we wear expose who we are, right, as individuals. Um, they are telling other people about um, where we're from, what our economic status is, what um, types of things we're interested in. And um, the idea of hiding in the light, which is a Dick Hebdige concept, maybe you know it, um, is a sense of um, that we're exposed, but we're also communicating, right? We're doing a sort of other meta-language communication with our clothing. And in some cases, it's very strong and very clear with a burqa, for example, right? And then in other cases, it's something that's much more subtle, where you might have 10 guys in American Apparel t-shirts, and maybe it's just one of them is wearing a Rolex, or one of them is wearing Converse, yeah. What's clear about the burqa? So someone taking, and we're gonna talk about this as we get more into that um, idea of what Simmel, our rate reading for today, calls objectified clothing or objectified choices, which have a value set that is more clear. Um, even though you might not have read um, the Cron or you might not know all of the um, sort of complexities of that subculture, when you see somebody wearing that, their value set is more clear to you than if you saw somebody wearing a Western clothing that was much more sort of leveled out and there might be greater numbers in your world that wear sort of a very simple, like if it was an American Pearl t-shirt and a pair of jeans. You might not be able to say whether that person is conservative or liberal, or even if they're American, for example, or what their faith is. So, um, and that's sort of something that we see happening with democratic capitalism. So, which is that it's sort of making our value sets much less clear with our clothing. So, um, but we'll get more into that. Um, okay. Okay. So I have. A little clip that I want to start with. You guys saw the um, Woodcover Center movie last year, right? Woodcover Center? Does that sound familiar? Yeah, yeah. No? You? Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we, all, we all did. The, 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 <laughs> in in um, Leslie Jordan's class. The okay. Bruno Hurtug. So. Yeah. Yes. Oh, right. So um, I, I feel like these sort of like brief glimpses of people in documentary film, and you may know this, Notebooks on Cities. Has anybody seen a few of you? Or one of you? <laughs> so we're going to look at a very small um, glimpse of Yoshi Yamamoto, who is a Japanese designer who came to France um, and um, is extremely dedicated to the art of fashion, um, which is really fashion design, is someone very slow, methodical, and really works um, in um, black and white primarily, um, and has sort of these radical perspectives of what he's doing. And he's also someone that's been through, since the time that this film was made, um, bankruptcies and rebrandings and sort of the sense of people trying to make a commercial idea out of him, which um, sort of goes against what he does. So let's just, hopefully it will work. It worked earlier. Let's do that escape. And then we'll go to this. No, oh, no, it's not that one here. Do you make it go over? Yeah, no, it'll close it. Oh, that's all right. Um, here, I'll do it. Sorry. Uh, here it is. And then I have um, two images of his clothes if you go forward to the next one. Um, which is this tension that he says is um, underlying his design, underlying his designs, which is that it should be new enough, it should be relevant, it should be interesting, but also classic. And so if you can imagine wearing something every day that felt new, you know that experience when you put on something new and it's like, oh, I'm wearing my, my new X, right? Whatever it is. And how alive you feel. But at the same time, what you were wearing felt like you could wear it forever, and it was all you ever needed. It's a new coat, it's the only coat I'll ever need, which is sometimes how you feel right about everything that you buy, but the sense that he wants to in imbue, he wants to instill in the clothing, in the designs, that sensibility. And this is a strong sensibility for designers of what's called the Antwerp Six, the deconstructionist designers, the Andy Mühlmeister. There's a set of designers that are aligned in sort of that sensibility of almost transforming our consciousness with clothes. 
And we're going to be talking so much about fashion media. Today is just I wanted to get this out there a little bit about the design capacity of fashion to sort of work with consciousness because it is so frequently dismissed. And so also you can see um, in these cases with the photographs that have been taken, the one on the left in 1989, and the one on the right, which is this current collection, um, are also provocative. They're also like, this isn't normal. This is something that interrupts the spectacle, right? Which is the intention of progressive and sort of the media that we focus on here um, at EGS is that idea of interrupting the spectacle, which is also what he's interested in doing in sort of the numbness we feel with capitalist and commercial fashion media. Okay, so we can go to the next. Okay, so just want to hear from you. What's the difference? I may call in people, perhaps. There are no volunteer speakers. I guess we could say, just kind of like briefly as a starting point, that, that clothing is maybe something that has a, it's, has a functional purpose. Okay. And, and fashion is, is one that moves into sort of signification and communication. Okay. I mean, I think, I think that line is not, is not so stark. I wasn't going to use the board, but I will, I will do that. And we'll say clothing fashion. Okay, so what did you, you said? It, it's functional. Functional, and then you're saying that fashion is more with? It signifies and communicates. Okay, so signification. Okay. Sorry, I hate writing because I'm always like, I can never write and talk and speak at the same time. Excuse me. Um, okay. Function and um, wearability or something of that nature and then signification. Okay. Other opinions? The uh, gentleman we just saw. Yoshi Yamamoto. Uh -huh. <coughs> sort of raised that dialectical dilemma between matter and form. Okay. So possibly we could equate clothing with the matter or the material. Okay. And uh, the fashion. <coughs> okay. Material and then form. Okay. All right. That's good. Thank you. Okay. What else? Can you say something, something like that between need and necessity versus desire? Good. That's the second portion of our class, right? Is desire? Okay, so need and desire. Um, augmented needs. That's what um, Guy Debord calls it in Society Spectacle. We live in a society of augmented needs, where we're received that we're needs. I need to check my email. How many people say that all the time, right? But we've been able to embrace augmented desires, like fashion. I need a new shirt, right? We've been able to embrace these things to call them needs, to turn them needs, to term them needs, which are meant to needs, which are truly desires, yes. Okay? Yep. Um, maybe when you put on clothing, it's this self-conscious, because it's made me more familiar. So when you put on clothing, it's... Well, the, the, as in Justin's sort of definition of functional clothing, so I get up in the morning, put on my jeans and t-shirt, I don't really think about it too much. Okay. Whereas fashion, I might be thinking about it more, this kind of shift. Okay, so maybe it's like um, clothing unconscious versus conscious thinking, maybe? Kind of, yeah. Or more conscious, you would say? Yes. Yeah. Um, because there's also, we didn't mention this, but there's also the case of like what's clean, like your laundry. So people say, I mean, I've been in fashion theory classes with students who are literally like, it was what was clean, you know? <laughs> this is what I'm wearing. I didn't think about it. I don't know. And then I'm like, well, you had to think about it when you bought it. No, my girlfriend gave it to me. Whatever. It's what I'm wearing. Okay. So that is a dimension of the function side, as you're saying, Michael, the sort of like, it, we just have to wear it, it's covering our bodies versus thinking about it, okay? What else? Yes? And just kind of going on with all of those things, I suppose it's like kind of like the part versus the whole, so it's like the building blocks and like the random, the things that don't in themselves necessarily have um, this intrinsic sort of meaning for you, but then when they're meaningfully assembled, then it has this whole so. Okay, so maybe it's like parts versus system of meaning. Yes. Okay, that's a good one. Right, because people call it the fashion world, the fashion industry, right? And anytime you have something like that, like for example, what does EGS do? It sustains the meaning of contemporary philosophy, right? The ideology, the hegemony, that's what EGS does. What does Vogue do? It sustains the meaning of fashion. 
So it's sustaining an ideology. And that's a fashion sustaining the ideology of clothes, essentially, right? Um, check my list. See if you guys got them all. Um, okay, and then there's something else. What else did Yoshi Yamamoto say? What was he saying that I pointed out at the end? And he said that he's trying to do with every piece of clothes that he designs. <laughs> well, immemorial, the question of making an object that exists throughout time as well as within time. Um, I think bringing up the temporal dimension of fashion is, mm -hmm. um, in his essay, What is the Contemporary? Uh, Agamben talks precisely about the paradoxical relationship of contemporaneity to notions of time and the concept of fashion with the in, in relation to just the everyday uh, understanding that something is either in fashion, but if it's in fashion, as soon as it's in fashion, it's out of fashion, it's passé, it's passed to another time, and the way that temporality works in relation to clothing. So yes. I would say that um, fashion is contemporary in a Gaumann sense, and mm -hmm. clothing is present in a linear kind of temporal sense. Exactly. Um, you could say clothing is more linear, more lasting, more. Um, what was the word you used? You said present. Present. So it's present. Okay. Present. Yes, it's always present in each culture, in each society. Exactly. So, very good. Descriptive. Um, and otherwise, you guys got them all. Unless there are, are there other, at least that I can think of. But maybe there's another. Any other clothing, fashion, contrast. Do you have one, Jacob? You're laughing. Uh, I was just thinking of the Goblin and how he spoke about. As so and as the, and, you know, religion versus science. Sorry. Sorry. Well, what is religion versus science being? Religion being both of them being sort of contemporary? Um, I suppose the, um, the logic um, or lack thereof when an individual decides to participate in the, in the fashion game. Well, it's, I mean, I mean, there is a sense that, I mean, and I brought this today. It's so funny because I, I was like, literally wondering, people are going to think I'm just reading, though. But I, I brought this because um, it's so funny. I, I actually didn't buy this magazine. I don't know whether you believe it or not, but um, a friend of mine had it, and I was like, can I take this magazine with me? Because when I saw the cover of the magazine, I was almost like, I haven't read one of these in so long because I look at so much stuff online. And I was like, wow, it's like a cultural artifact. You know, I always look at things like, well, what if I were a time traveler? I know that's crazy, but right? We have to think this way about media. And in the sense that this material is dictating, I mean, it is. It's, it's the religion, right? And so it's giving you the rules, and it's telling you what to wear, right? And, it's, it's, and then it's like 126 real-life looks for everyone. Like, I mean, the kind of, uh, like, mentality, the thinking, um, the ideology, it's interesting to bring up science, to bring up religion in the senses of, of ideology, because when you think of religion is radically different from faith, for example. Dressing, style, radically different from fashion. So, um, the, it would really be style aligning with faith and religion aligning with fashion, right? So, that sense of radical difference and sort of that system of meaning, which can be overbearing and overwhelming. I mean, these girls that follow fashion, fashionistas, I don't, I would just collapse under the weight and the pressure of, it would be like following a religion, right? To a T and to, and feeling the sense of obedience. And so there's a difference between fashion and style um, in that sensibility. So that's an important distinguish, uh, distinguishment, which we'll talk about style in this class. Okay, yes. Um. I just wanted to like, know the difference between clothing and fashion in a way. I think it sort of goes into need and desire, but it's not something about um, emotional and physical comfort um, that comes from clothing and also that maybe fashion goes for sometimes, but also uh, also tries to elicit the exact opposite, also tries to elicit discom emotional and physical discomfort. Um, and so I'm not sure exactly how to put that into one word on a, on a chart. It's not it's okay. it's yes. comfort and discomfort, but mm -hmm. sort of um, this uh, they, they sort of exist in different 
in ways in clothing and fashion. Mm. Was it, was, uh, how um, the, the, the comforting that you inhabit the, the clothing. When you think about what you wear, then when no one sees you, right? When you're at home and you're just whatever you're doing versus what you wear, what you wear to be fashionable to be presentable, there is a very big difference in that, for sure. And I don't think, I'm not a dialectic person, and I, I wasn't going to do that, but I just thought that would be helpful to remember what somebody else said. Um, because I do think that as I have the arrows, I sort of think everything meets, right? I don't really see it as oppositional, but that's a good example, um, or a good suggestion. Yeah, yeah just going along with Sophia's point, don't they talk about, um, wearable, about wearable pieces? Mm. It's a term that's used. It's yes. unwearable, unwearable, what the hell is <laughs> yeah. it? Unwearable things, you know. I mean, there are some completely unwearable things, right? If we, yeah. Like that Yo Yohia Momoto thing. I mean, things that you, that person's not getting on the metro if they have like an eight foot hat, right? Like, so that is definitely the case. And that, but that's a sense of fashion speaking in the same way that media speaks, right? It's louder fashion than other pieces. So, I mean, there's also that potential for fashion to be a vehicle or a media for ideas. And they can be legitimate ideas. They don't always have to be disposable ideas. They can be transformative ideas. And so that's um, important as well. OK, and this piece, sorry it's such a small picture. It's hardly been uh, recorded. But um, Vivian Westwood, 1998, this is tights that she made, of course, like Adam and Eve. Um, but um, I just think it's kind of an interesting question, because we didn't really get to it. But that wasn't one of the thoughts. Is modesty and protection is important clothing, right? Um, if we were all nude, we would be completely disarmed and vulnerable. And so there's that sense of wanting to protect ourselves, like these are our weapons in a way, our protection, our armor, that kind of give us safety um, from other people. So that's also a dimension. Um, okay, can you go to the next one? Okay, and so this is just, I have two just functional just slides to show you. It is also this idea of design, because we'll be talking about media the rest of the time, is important, which is that People who are really invested in fashion design um, think about how things move from the functional to the interpretive. So you, when you think of armor, just at a really basic level, like they're wearing that, in a battle to protect themselves. That's why the armor is being worn. And then designers take that towards the interpretive. Here the corset was transformed um, into armor. And then um, in this case, that's Dolce Gabbana. And in this case, Hussein Shalayan. Has anyone heard of him? He's very important, actually. For anybody who's interested, um, he's made a lot of films of his pieces because they're action-based, they have movement components. So um, he made a dress that was similar to armor, but then the back lifts up, which is sort of this provocative sexual component of like, why can we lift the back? Like, what is that about? And sort of this sense of putting um, technology into clothing. And so all of this sort of originating with armor and designers kind of pushing that to extremes and taking what used to be very functional, making it something more subtle and interpretive for our contemporary society. And then just one more explanatory is, in this case, um, I mentioned the really progressive designers. You can go to the, okay. the progressive designers called the Antwerp Six. And so if you were to be in an elevator with Anna Wintour, you can ask her, you know, what do you think happened in the Antwerp Six? Because, and she would just be like, hmm. Because there is such a small niche of designers who were so radically devoted that they would not advertise. They would not show their clothing. They would not even tell people. You know, until Martin Margiela's clothing line, who was one of the Antwerp Six, was bought by Diesel, you didn't have anybody, like, there was no sign in front of the store. There was nothing. It was like, my clothes will not be sold. They will be designed. And they will be so progressive in their thought that you won't even understand it. <laughs> and that was that sort of radical fashion design that was very common to Europe. I would say between, 81 was Antwerp 6, so I would say early 80s until early 90s, which was um, when Yuhi Yamamoto was um, in the documentary. And so in this case, you have the finished sweater, which his design inspiration was a life jacket. But we don't necessarily think of that. Or the inner tube, right? The sense of the life jacket, jacket, the inner tube. And his concept to create a sweater that when you put it on, you feel so safe and so protected. You know, but those ideas of safe, safe and protection aren't necessarily overt. They're more subtle. And so that subtlety of fashion design is really the art of fashion um, that is so essential to many people who are dedicated to it. Um, so I just wanted to kind of preface all of our discussion of fashion media with that. Um, I thought it was important to make note of these designers because they are 
so essential, and we won't be talking about that the rest of the time. Yes. Um, what was the name of the designer? So there, I have um, all everything is captioned, um, but you just can't see it. And I don't know. I'm wondering if I can raise it. I'm gonna try to raise it. Does anyone know if this can be raised? Uh, with adjusting things soon, so you're not actually going to physically be able to raise the mm -hmm. DVD. Oh, you're going to be able to is there a, the image up okay, let me try to do that. Yeah. Is it on the uh, <laughs> yeah, remote? Remote, maybe? Yeah, it's a good <laughs> call the keystone mm -hmm. if it's on there, but that's my only thought. Thank you. Let's see. Does so anyone see the brand on that? That's it. Oops. So um, this is the most difficult name. It's Walter Van Beerendolph. That was his name. Um, and he was part of the Antwerp Six. Um, and this is actually from 2008. But he's very radical. He does show clothes now and does um, much more um, complicated things. I can. I think during the break. Because oh, during the break. To, exactly. Um, I'm gonna have to do the names. Thank you very much, Isaac. Okay. Um, all right, so moving forward. Um, just wanted to also just touch on history as well, because we're not going to be talking about these things, is that there's this a whole idea of fashion boards that come from a lot of people point historical origins to aristocracy, and they would say, oh, it's Marie Antoinette. But that's kind of a misconception. I um, wanted to start with this French glove, which is one of the oldest pieces owned in the world that's preserved. That's technically a designed piece of fashion. It's from 1590, um, and it's actually at the Met in New York, and it's a French glove. There's only one, because you know, it's like the laundry, you lose the other one. And I don't know where it is, but there's just one. And this gives you an example of the ornate decorative capacity of fashion as, as far as long ago as 1590. Because you'll hear people talk about fashion, look at it. It's only been around since you know the 19th century, the sensibility, that's not correct. It's actually something that was integrated to aristocracy. 15th, 16th century, and while there's a generalization that it's French, it's not the case. It's actually um, more of an, oops, sorry, an Italian sensibility. Um, and also, a little point that we don't think about a lot, is um, it wasn't until a certain point that everybody who couldn't afford things um, were walking around partially nude. Um, there was a lot of nudity, actually, throughout Greek culture and Roman culture, which you may be aware of. If you were a slave, you didn't have anything. You were always new in Greek and Roman culture. Um, by the time that um, society developed, um, by the 1500s, there was a sense of civilization, and the court began to decorate themselves with much more detail. And so if you were hired as a servant, you received one set of clothes. And that had to last you for as long as it possibly could. And that was your payment for working, was to receive clothes. So our idea of having a 1,000 sweaters that we have to choose from is really almost insane, right? So um, that's something we don't think very much about. And, and the idea of also uniforms as well. In schools and military, military uniforms started because that was how to get soldiers. Like, you know, these people didn't have anything and they wanted to align them and to unify them and they gave them uniforms because these people would be wearing torn t-shirts and maybe who knows what. So the, the clothing was a gift of a payment of services rendered and also in schools as well because a lot of children would come to school without anything to wear. So um, a sort of sense of clothing being functional. And then just two more images of the court system. The reason we know this um, is that this is a Venice um, image from the 18th century. At its height, um, really it was the 16th century, but the 16th century through the 18th century, the sense of the turn of clothing. So you would have something to wear for music, something to wear for dance, something to wear for dinner, something to wear to greet a person. And your day was changing clothes, if you were in aristocracy. Appropriateness. Right? which is a dimension of fashion that's so important to us. People say, oh, what to wear to a job interview, what to wear on a date. That sense of the assignment or the rule system of <coughs> hegemony of fashion originates with aristocracy, meaning that sense of appropriateness for whatever activities they were doing. And again, this misconception that the French sort of own fashion is really... Um, I've been teaching French fashion history is not the case. Some of the most interesting things coming out of Scandinavia, in this case, um, a dress requiring you know, about six to eight people behind you to help you with the train. So wherever you went, you needed your entourage, right? And so that sensibility of um, it being a, a sign of waste, which is really the, the piece for this class, the um, Thorsten Veblen, if anybody's ever read him, or it's for this class, it's the theory of the leisure class, um, is the more you waste, the more powerful you are, right? 
And we have this green consciousness now that goes against that. But that was definitely the case then. And what happened is that with democratic capitalism, right, you have the sense that everyone can buy and everyone can waste. And so the most famous essay, Paris Capital of the 19th Century, with if you have not read it, I hope a sort of shame falls on you now, and you should go read it, because we're not reading it for this class. But many means, um, Paris Capital of the 19th Century, which is fascinating for a number of reasons, um, but his study of the arcades, which developed in the 1800s in Paris, which were the commercial marketplaces, um, was an enormous shift in the consciousness of people and what they could be. Because suddenly, by the 1800s, you have people being able to buy fabrics being able to get a variety of fabrics. So they're still making their dresses, okay? They're still making most of their clothes. But the idea of variety and not having to wear servants' clothes, being able to wear a lot of things. And as soon as this happens, there's a big shift in aristocracy. They stop wearing prints, they start wearing solids. They stop wanting to look like the lower classes. And this is something that um, in our simul essay we're, we're going to talk about as a group. But that shift of consumption and fashion being something you can buy, you can own it, you can look like anybody really was a huge shift in people's thinking about clothes. But as Benjamin was walking through the arcades, which are basically the shopping malls of Paris um, that were built during that time, the covered shopping, which was a big thing because you have to realize people, there was no covered shopping. And if you were a lady, you did not go out on a dirty ground and walk around and buy your, your goods, right? You sent your servant. You didn't even leave the house. People came to see you. And so suddenly there's covered shopping where you can go and you can walk around and it's safe and it's clean and you can see things. And so people begin to consume and begin to look at fashion and fabrics and designs and corsets in the window. And anything can be theirs, right? And so a few years later in the 1930s, when Benjamin writes this, he says, you know what fashion is? It's not clothes. He calls fashion is a prescribed ritual by which the fetish commodity wished to be worshipped. What does that mean? It's reminiscent of uh, Fraser's work or, or Freud and the stone of taboo and that uh, perhaps the uh, the fetish. Okay, well what's the fetish? Um, perhaps in this instance the fetish would be uh, the fashion itself rather than the material object. Okay. Um, so the, it's an idea fetish. Okay. The ritual in this instance would be um, going to the arcade and glancing through the windows at the, at the material objects um, rather than being secluded. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it's the reproduction. And, it's, let's see, you, just to get names again, it was <coughs> Jacob and Matt. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's the reproduction of the ritual where meaning is hooked up to the image. It's the, I mean, the last part? Where, where meaning is hooked up to the appearance of the image. Meaning and appearance are connected, and it's a <coughs> contemporary version of, of this. So it's a reinvention of the ritual of the fetish. Because the fetish is what? Originally, what was the fetish? The oldest definition of fetish is what? The origin of the word. Someone has to know. This is the essence of commodification. I didn't, you must know. No? Someone has to know. Yes, Mike. Oh, there we go. Um, is it status? Sorry? Status. 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 Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, fetish comes from fetus, which means... Yeah, you can look at it on, on there. Okay, yes, go ahead. Fetish comes from fetus, which means to... Uh, how do you say that in English? Uh, to throw a spell or to, to put someone under a spell. Okay. Well, mystification. It's connected to mystification. So people think fetish and they think, oh, Freud and shoes, right? No, right? The fetish comes from... It actually goes back to the imperialists who would go into the darkest parts of Africa, take over, slaughter, kill, and take <coughs> people with them. And they said, these people will leave their homes, they'll leave their family, and they won't leave a fetish, this mystical thing. They would not leave. They would hold something to their chest they believed was, would save them. 
And so what they held to their chest were idols or objects, and the term they described them, oh, it's a mystical thing, they, this thing that they have to have. And that is, of course, later part of this sort of mystification, this obsession, this thing you need to have in the sort of psychoanalytic, right? The thing you have to have to feel safe, to feel good, to be fulfilled, to reach orgasm, whatever it is. That's so... Uh, that's the definition of a exactly, would be the idol or the piece. And so, if you can go to the next slide. So, this is super important in fashion, right? Because this idea of fetish is connected to the idea of adornment as well, and what we surround ourselves with, whether what we decorate with, um, what we find significant, and of course there is this sort of mystification idea, and we still see um, a lot of iconology all over in fashion or whatever, whether it's done with purposeful meaning, because someone does believe um, in this object, or whether it's done as decoration, is a dimension, especially with jewelry and accessories, and that whole thing, we can't forget about that, right? that even someone who's not wearing fashion might be decorative in their jewelry. Um, but if you can go to the next slide. But it's also the case with branding, right? Because branding is an ideological status symbol or fetish symbol or object of significance. And so I don't know how many of you have read, again, please read it, Arthur, Danto, uh, Arthur Danto's Transfiguration of the Commonplace. Is anyone? I'm sure a few of you. Anyone? Yes. Okay, so your name again? Uh, well, my name is Ryan. I, yeah, I'm familiar with with uh, yeah some of this stuff. Um, I'm not sure if I've gotten around to reading that particular one though. But okay. yeah, I'm familiar with his ideas though. Yeah. So, in in Arthur Danto's Transfiguration of the Commonplace, you take something like Andy Warhol and a soup can, right? So Andy Warhol's soup can, it's a soup can. We're eating soup. We're living our lives, you know. And then Andy Warhol says, "No, it's art. I'm going to paint it and make it interesting and put it on the wall." and you're going to worship it, right? So this idea of taking common things and turning them into magical things is really essential to, essential to fashion branding, right? So if someone gives you a sweater and there's no tag in it, nothing, right? They're just saying, you're, you're cold, here, put on the sweater, it's, it's fine. And then if someone gives you a sweater and it's branded and maybe it's very special and it's a limited edition, it has that magical or transformative feeling that it's something different. And that ideological dimension, or that mystical dimension of what fashion is, is something extra. It goes back to this idea of the system of meaning, which I forgot who said that. Was it? No. Someone. Yes. And so, in this case, obviously, if someone has a bag, unmarked bag, there's a different sensibility than, obviously, the Louis Vuitton. Which you may know, Karl Marx said, why is it that an ounce of gold is equal to a ton of ore? You know, this is, it's the mystical dimension use value versus this sort of myth surrounding this thing that's special, right? And so that's, that's where fashion tries to be. It tries to be special, and especially with branding, because if it's special, it's worth a lot more, right? People pay a lot more for the bag on that side than this one, right? Unless this one has some extra myth, like maybe Marilyn Monroe carried it over to me, JFK, and then all of a sudden that one's worth a lot, right? Because it has a myth. And so branding is an easy way to mass produce myth and make things more valuable. Okay. Sorry, I'm talking a lot. Okay, and then most, the most interesting one has just happened. Does anyone know about this? This is the most interesting example. Yves Saint Laurent is now Saint Laurent. <laughs> so I just thought I would throw that in there because this is the perfect example. It's so special, he's a saint. <coughs> so, I mean, just kind of, um, these are dimensions which we'll talk some about, but important things that I wanted to um, introduce, introduce you guys to in terms of ideas, and then if you can go to the next one. Okay, so the rest of our course, we are going to leave fashion behind us in terms of the material thing. Um, we will talk a little bit more simile, but we're going to be talking about fashion media. And these are just some things, <clears throat> don't have to worry about it, I just threw them up there. We're going to be talking about this idea. Like, I mean, there are people who have loaded guns on all these opinions who think fashion media is purely journalism, fashion media is propaganda, it's gender bias, like, you know, and people are going to come with, you, with loaded opinions on this topic. I'm much more in the sense that fashion media is like any media, and it is very subjective, and it is going to have a lot of different opinions, and so I don't hold any one of these very firmly, and 
Thank you, Paulette. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, and obviously this is just to demonstrate that, that there are all these authorities on what's fashionable. I think it's hilarious, right? Like, there are tons of different authorities that say, oh, you can wear this, you can wear that. Just keep going forward. Um, and that's, of course, the blogger now with new media. These people, they're supposedly, like, the most, you know, gifted saints of the world that are, that are doing a, a lot in fashion media. Does anyone follow a particular fashion blog in here? Yeah. Anyone? Oh, okay, which one do you follow? Um. Uh, the Boulevardier, okay. an anarchy blog. Okay. Um, as, yeah, that I, uh, okay. So there are a lot of street style blogs that are really popular, you may have heard of, and that type of thing. So um, I just wanted to mention that is obviously relevant to fashion media, and we will talk about it. Um, and then, um, but this is where we're going to spend the rest of our time. Excited? <laughs> no, um, we're going to be looking at. Um, on, on the right and on the left, um, these are obviously both fashion photographs, but the one on the right represents the editorial dimension, and the one on the left is the commercial dimension, right? So fashion photography will be our focus, specifically fashion photography and desire, and editorials being the center of magazines that t tell stories by photographers, but also sort of sell clothes as well, and then on the left, more overt advertisements, which are commercially marketing a good. But um, on the left, um, what's interesting is what's going on with Tom Ford, and I have just images, you can just scroll through them, but just from the Tom Ford campaign right now, may, you guys may have seen this. This is the current Tom Ford campaign for um, spring summer 2012, um, and he shoots it himself, um, and it's based on a photographer that we'll be talking about this afternoon, which is Guy, Guy Bourdain. I don't know if you've heard of him, but we'll be talking about him this afternoon. And, um, you know, and if you can just stop here for one second. So, I mean, in this case, this is a perfume. Ad, right, but um, pretty much, I mean, some people could say it's soft core, right? I mean, and it's an ad, it's a billboard right now. Any, no one's in Los Angeles, but it's a billboard right now in LA. If you've got a wet fetish, it's hardcore. I'm sorry? If you've got a wet fetish, it's hardcore. Yeah, <laughs> well, I guess it would depend, yes. On, um, and then if you keep, keep going, and then there's even more that to me seem like this is fashion advertising. I mean, it's fashion perfume, but um, the art of clothes. And so if we think back to this idea of um, really concept idea driven um, industry, not about the material really, not about the form even, but about brands and ideas, it's obviously selling what? Six cents. It's selling the brand as sex. It's aligning it, right? And that's his brand concept, so it's pretty quite clearly doing that. But is it good, is it bad? I mean to be decided in the next three days. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's see, is it 11.20? We can take a break and come back and then it's all you guys for our reading discussion. So hopefully some of you have read. I'm hoping.